with me. Last Sunday I began a, just a two-part series, which is not really a series, it's a two-part message, on the subject, revival faith. The church needs revival. We as individuals need revival. We need a refreshing. I, I, I see signs of revival as we open up our hearts to the Lord. I, I, I see an intensity in a, in a group of people who are seeking the face of God. And I want to see that intensity increase, and I want to see that group increase who is seeking after God, because God responds when His people come according to His Word. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, turning from the sinfulness in our lives, turning from the, the, the liturgy in our lives, turning from the complacency in our lives, getting serious with God getting serious with God. We're grateful for God's goodness and His faithfulness towards us. I've chosen for a text, as you know, of course, the second, the first chapter, the first book of, of Kings, first book of Kings, chapter 18, with a cross-reference by the Apostle James in chapter 5 of James, verses 17 and 18. Israel had gone completely into idolatry. She had left God, she had turned her back on the deliverer. She was now worshiping idols, and, and Ahab the king was leading it. The, he was putting to death the, re, the leaders, the religious leaders, the, the, the prophets of God. And, of course, God brought a famine in the land. Elijah prayed, and God brought a famine. And that famine was so intense that you and I could not even imagine the extent of it. But Israel needed to turn back to God. She needed a revival. She needed to get back to her relationship with Jehovah, God, as she had had before. But now it was gone. And so God spoke to, uh, to, to Elijah. And the text is very simple. It's found in the 18th chapter of, of, of the First Kings. He said to Elijah, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will bring rain upon the earth. Ahab obeyed and went to see Ahab, or Elijah obeyed and went to see Ahab, and, and uh, it's amazing as you read the 18th chapter of 1 Kings that you will identify at least nine and maybe ten uh, principles of revival faith. We need revival. The church needs revival. There is a barrenness in the church. Thank God for what he's doing in pockets, but folk, listen. The greater church world today has no concept of the move of God. It has no conviction to bring sinners to a, to, to a, a Christ. There's no, there's no sense of the Spirit of God allowed to move anymore. And we have established in our hearts here at Peel Pentecostal that we're going to have revival by the proper process. And that is a process of repenting. It is a process of getting back to God. It's a process of leaning, process of leaning on the old-fashioned way of seeking the face of God and going before the Lord and realizing our poverty spiritually and crying out to God. Listen, many of us are very poor in our spirits. And we need a fresh outpouring of the Spirit of God. I believe what we experienced in this audience this morning as we worshiped was the sense of a lover coming alongside of us and saying, I'm here, I'm here, make yourself available. I am here, make yourself available. How many know that we're the bride of Christ and Jesus loves the bride? And in too many times, in too many cases, the bride is ignoring the bridegroom. I want to say that we want to get back in passionately in love with Jesus Christ, passionately in love with the Word of God, passionately in love with the agenda of God. And the agenda of God begins with repentance. It begins with us going back to where we left our first love. And it, 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 depends, it depends upon seeking the face of the Lord and making ourselves available to God. God give the church in Canada. God give the church in North America a revival of a sense of his presence one more time. Amen. We need revival. It is our lifeblood. The generation behind us needs revival. And so we've been looking at what revival faith is. There's got, to, there's got to be faith in operation. Faith is, is, is not simply a woozy little statement that we use, but faith is a confidence that God would do what God promised to do. So that faith propels us then to submit to God. 
to submit to his word, to submit to his instructions. And that's what we're talking about in this short series I've been sharing with you. So last week we looked at uh, some incredible truths here in the 18th chapter of 1 Kings. We looked at the fact that the, the revival faith um, is an obedient faith. I love it. In, 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 in chapter 18, verse the first, two, the first few lines of the second verse, in the first verse he said, Go show yourself to Ahab. And in the second verse, the simply says, Elijah went. Folk, that's not complicated. Doesn't need a theologian to pull that line apart. He simply went up, got up, and went. God is looking for obedience in his people. And obedience is a condition of revival. Elijah demonstrated obedient faith. The second thing I pointed out last week was that the revival faith is confident faith. We've got to understand who we are in Christ. We've got to understand why we're here. We've got to understand that our past is forgiven, our present is exciting, and our future is assured because God has saved us by His grace. We've got to be confident that God has a plan and He wants to use us. And so in the 8th verse, uh, he, when Obadiah said, Elijah, if I go to tell the king, Ahab, that you're here, he said, you're going to disappear again. It's not going to do it, he said. And then Elijah said, go tell Ahab, Elijah is here. Now that might sound a little boasting first when we hear it, but it's not. Here was a man of God, convinced of the mission on which God had sent him, confident in the God who had sent him, and his faith was strong enough that God was going to bring that revival, he was going to bring that fire, he was going to bring that rain, that he said, you tell, Eli, you tell Ahab that Elijah is here. I believe it's time for the church to rise up in the strength of the Spirit of God and to declare to the world that the bride of Christ is here and she's connected with the groom and there's going to be some, there's going to be some reviving going on and there's going to be some invasion of the kingdom of darkness and there's going to be some victories in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I, I want you to know that the devil, I want the devil to be scared when he drives by this place and when he drives by your home. I want the devil to say, don't you go by, down that street because so-and-so is on that street and they're praying and they're believing God. And if you go down there, you're in trouble and it's your own fault. I believe it's time for the church to stir herself to get back in league with God Almighty and to see the power of God do what God wants to do. Amen. I believe our, our culture, I believe our community is sick of churches just opening and closing, opening and closing, opening and closing, and a place to have a fine banquet, and a place to have a fine sing-along, but the church, the world needs the church to be alive and in touch with God Almighty, amen, where there is conviction in the pure, amen, conviction in the hearts of men and women, where there's conviction in the preaching of the Word of God. I don't think the devil is one bit concerned about a nice homily. Point one, point two, point three, sub point A, B, sub point A, B, sub point A, B. Have a good day. God bless you. See you next week. That does not shake hell, and it doesn't trouble the devil. It's when a church is praying. It's when a church is, 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 is really coming under the lordship of Christ. When a church is seeking the face of God, that's when the devil worries and begins to develop a strategy, but he cannot defeat because we are walking in the will of God. Understand that. We're walking in the will of God. And so he said, Elijah is here, tell him. The second thing we discovered last week was that revival faith is bold faith, and sometimes brazen. In the 18th verse, Ahab said to Elijah, Oh, are you the one that's troubling Israel? And Elijah said, No, sir. You and your father's house, you and your family is the one that is troubling Israel, not this preacher. You see, when you get fervent for God, you're going to get singled out. You're going to get targeted. And the, and the attack will come from so many different places. But revival faith is bold and sometimes very brazen. Amen. Bold and brazen. The fourth thing we discovered is that, and it's no surprise, 
that a, a, a revival faith is a decisive faith. Elijah said in the 21st verse, make up your minds about who is God in your life. I think that applies to the 21st century church, particularly the Pentecostal 21st century church, more than ever before. Who is God? Who is God in your life? Is God a convenience? Is God someone we connect with on a very casual basis and then in a very vibrant way on Sunday, and then the rest of the week it's all about us and the world? Who's God? Elijah said, make up your mind. Who's God are you going to serve? What God are you going to serve? The fifth thing we discovered where I closed off last week was that revival faith is focused. All or nothing faith. I love it. In the 24th verse, listen to what he said in the 24th verse of chapter 20, of 18. And call you on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answered by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. He said, it's got to be all or nothing. Winner takes all. But here's an interesting side note as I was studying and preparing for this, I discovered Baal was the sun god of the heathen whom Israel was now worshiping. He was, he was the sun god and he was the god of the, hel- the elements and the forces of nature in their theology. Think about it. Elijah was bold and brazen enough to meet them on their own ground. Winner takes all. It is is an incredible thing to think about. Elijah knew that God was who God was. He had seen the fire, he he knew about the fire on David's sacrifice. He he knew about the fire that came from heaven on the day of the, in in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, on the day that Solomon dedicated his temple. He he knew that fire. And so here was a a, 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 a actual, actual contrast. And Elijah called him out on it. He knew that God was the God of heaven. He had no worry about losing this battle to Ahab. You see, revival faith is just like that. It is confident. It is bold. It is, it is, it is without apology. We've gotten so soft today. We, we want to apologize for this and apologize for that. If we are kind of running contrary to the values of the world. The values of the church will always collide with the values of the world. Hear what I'm saying now. The church needs to rise up with revival faith and say, Oh God, oh God, restore us again in the values that are valuable and that are valued by you. Holiness, righteousness, godliness just to speak of a few. The sixth characteristic of revival faith is found in 33rd, 34th, and 35th verses of chapter 18. I call it, it's a real and transparent faith. Real and transparent. It's also found in the 25th verse. Just read the 25th verse. And call on your gods, and I will call on the Lord. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourself and dress it first, for ye are many. And call on the name of your God, but do not put fire on it. I, 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 I've seen people try to, to manufacture revival. I've seen pastors, I've seen movements try to manufacture revival. And they measure the revival by the crowds that come. Bad measurement. Justin Bieber can get a crowd, but he ain't revival. All the sports stars can get a crowd, but it ain't revival. Revival cannot be measured by the crowd. It must be measured by the repentance and the brokenness and then uh, then evaluated by the presence of God amongst his people. Amen. You see, we, 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 we have listened in the church. We're as bad as the world. In this what I'm going to say, crowds flock after the latest actress 
and the latest movie stars and the latest uh, number one hits on the radio and in Hollywood and in the music. Folk, in the church, we are almost that bad as well. Someone can come up with a teaching, get it in print, get it on, out in the radio, get it in news, and, and get them at a stadium, and God's people flock there for one more instruction on something that they should have known all the time. See, it's not popular to preach what I'm preaching this morning. But the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, the Pentecostal Assemblies of Newfoundland, the Pentecostal Assemblies of North America, of, 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 of the Assemblies of God, we need revival. We need revival. And folk, if we don't get it, you know the problem? We have the ability now to manufacture something to replace it, but it'll be empty. It'll be tasteless. It'll leave us empty and void. We need Holy Ghost, old-fashioned, altar-inspired, prayer-inspired revival! <laughs> revival! If you're here today and you've got a spouse not saved, your spouse needs you to get revived. If you're here today and you've got children that are not saved, your children need you to get revived and intercede until God breaks through in your home and in your family and you see the salvation that God means for us to experience. Amen. Amen. I would rather for people to have no experience with God than a fake experience. Mm. So Elijah said, this is going to be real. I am not going to fabricate any. I'm not going to bring in any props of any kind. And so in the 25th verse, and then the 33rd, 34th, and 35th, I love it as I read it. Let me read it to you. And, and the 30, 34th, 3rd verse says, And he put the wood in order and cut up the bullock in pieces, laid them on the fire, and said, Fill four barrels with water. Excuse me. He, he's going to build a fire. He's asking God to send the fire from heaven. And he's going to begin it by pouring water on the sacrifice. I think that's pretty real and transparent, isn't it? 34th verse, do it the second time. And they did it the second time. Do it the third time. And they did it the third time. The water ran around about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. You see, revival faith is not phony faith. When revival comes from the hand of the Lord, it's not fake or trickery. I've seen, I've seen preachers, and I've seen evangelists, and I've seen movements try to, to develop trickery and, and fakeness uh, to make people's, get people's attention. But when God moves, when we have a revival that's real and solid and lasts, it, it's old-fashioned. There's no trickery, and there's no, none of these things going on. There's nothing fake about it. It doesn't, it doesn't include any kind of gimmickry at all. Folk, I have no intentions of offering you gifts to get you to come to church. None whatsoever. If you don't get drawn by the Spirit of God and what God is doing in your life and the ministries of God that's in this church, then you're going to have to stay outside or go look for another church. Because we do not entertain at Peel Pentecostal Tabernacle. There's only one person in this house that we want to please, Pastor, in our worship and in our music, in our preaching, in our surrender, in our teaching. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me put in a plug here for our children's pastor. We don't babysit here either, do we, Pastor Kim? No, 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 no. You drop off your child at any age from newborn to, to age 12, and they're going to get some kind of biblical teaching and principles of Jesus Christ. We will adapt it to suit their age, but that's what they're going to get. Amen. And we don't babysit in this sanctuary. We preach the Word of God. We worship. We don't entertain. We don't believe in trickery or fakery or anything like that to get a crowd. We believe that if we are in the position God wants us to be, God will draw by His Holy Spirit. There is no doubt in our hearts about that. 
So it's a real and transparent faith. Revival faith is a real and transparent faith. The seventh thing is that it's a fearless faith. Look at verse 20, 27. Dropping back to verse 27 for a moment. It's fearless. Came to pass at noon, and Elijah mocked them. They spent the whole morning dancing and singing and howling. Sounds like some worship I've heard. Some supposed Pentecostal service that I've seen. They leaped them on the altar that was made, but there was no answer. Then Elijah said, cry aloud. He is a God, isn't he? Either he is talking or pursuing or he is in a journey or maybe he sleeps and needs someone to welcome him, to awaken him. It's a fearless faith. Say, what are you doing going to church? Da, 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 da. Well, we're seeking God for revival. We've got our minds made up for revival. We're seeking the face of the Lord. And you're going to do that through continual prayer? Sure, we can fill up the church. If you'll just, if you'll just let so-and-so come in, if you'll just let this happen, that happen, if, you, if you we're more contemporary here or there, we, we can get the church. We're not, we're not looking for that. We're looking for God to be pleased with our worship. We're looking for our hearts to be broken in in His presence. We're looking for a spirit of conviction to come upon every one of us, including our pastoral staff. And we find ourselves before God, pouring ourselves out, uh, surrendering our hearts, surrendering even some ways that we have held on to that we need to let go. And just surrendering to God and saying, God, whatever's in my life that could be hindering the work that you want done, Lord, purify it, rid it, get rid of it. Hallelujah. And that's what God wants in your life. God wants a full surrender. Every one of you, God is calling every one of us, church, to take an inventory of our lives, an inventory of our priorities, an inventory of what consumes our times, an inventory of what's important to us, an inventory of our thoughts, an inventory of our language, an inventory of our our attitudes. Whoa, pastor, you're getting down too deep. I'm getting down where God can do something. We'll hear what he's saying to us. Amen. God wants us to, to, to lay ourselves before him. So that he can move in our lives. God is with us. He's amongst us. And must be a fearless faith. The eighth measure of revival faith that I see in this chapter is what I call action faith. See, I can take you to all kinds of good books and even some seminaries. And they can teach revival from a book like you wouldn't believe. But there's never revival. We've got to take it from beyond the book. And we've got to apply it to our lives. We've got to take action. In verses 30 to 32, here is what Elijah did. He, I love it. In my old King James Version that I've had since 1971, when I got saved, I had some notes made. Back to the 30th verse, Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Oh, my goodness. Think about it. Let me read it to you again. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. The altar was broken down. What was the altar? The altar was their place of worship. The altar was their place of sacrifice. There was no coming to God at that time in that Hebraic culture where they just came. They came with a sacrifice. And then there was a, 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 a sacrificial system that covered them. But here you see the altar was broke down. How's the altar in your life, church? Have you visited recently? The altar... Was, was so neglected. How many understand that everything we have, if, it, if it's neglected, it falls apart? You neglect maintenance on your automobile, eventually it will fall apart. You neglect general maintenance around your home, and eventually things just seem to pipe begin to leak. Things begin to happen. There's a little shifting. There's, there's all kinds of things. If you neglect that maintenance, your house over the years will slide into being an eyesore in the neighborhood. 
But each spring, you do your spring maintenance. You touch up this, you touch up that. You give it a paint job and all this sort of thing. What are you doing? You're keeping that place that's important to you maintained. So I read clearly here in in this chapter that the altar was broken down. You know why? Nobody had taken the time to attend to it. Now what is the altar? The altar in both the Old and New Testament is a symbol of the meeting place with God. In the Old Testament, it was quite profound because the sacrifice was laid on the altar. Little did they understand this, but every sacrifice looked forward to the day when Jesus Christ would die on a cross uh, and be the sacrifice for the sin of mankind. And so the place of worship was broken down. Uh, My mind goes back to Hezekiah's day or Josiah's day when, when, when the temple was so badly neglected that they could hardly use it. So Josiah, a young godly king, ordered that the temple be cleaned up and, 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 and revisited. And while they were looking in the temple, they found, guess what they found? The book of the law. And they found it and they read it and there was revival under Josiah. Read about Josiah's revival. When we neglect the spiritual things of our lives, they will not just happen. It, you've got to be intentional about your, 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 your devotion to God. The world has so many attractions. The world has so much to take our time that if we don't intentionally set aside time to pray, set aside time to read the Word of God, set aside time to fellowship, set aside time to special seasons to draw close to God, it will never happen. It will never happen. Revival comes when we are intentional. It comes when we put aside those regular routines that displease God and we replace them with with routine and devotion that pleases God. That's revival. That's what revival is. It's a reviving of our passion for God and the things of God. It's a visitation by the Spirit of God that strengthens us and gives, takes us to a new height of, of service unto Him. And so the altar was the meeting place with God and Elijah prepared it. And there can be no revival until the meeting place of the altar where we surrender and sacrifice is repaired in our lives and prepared in our sacrifice. Our sacrifice is priority and surrender. Church, we're always being tempted to schedule God in amongst all the other things we do. Well, I got this on prayer meeting and I can't go. I got this on early prayer meeting and I can't come. I got this on another prayer meeting. I got this. All of these things are crowding out what God wants to do in our lives. And we need to simplify our lives a little bit. How important is revival to you? You have a son or a daughter that's not saved? You have a spouse that's not saved? You have a neighbor that's not saved? You have a workmate that's not saved? You understand that the unsaved are lost? You understand that the unsaved go to hell? A real hell? I'm almost afraid to say this, but oh Lord, somehow or other, give us a fresh vision of hell in its reality. What is your passion for seeking God? What is your passion for getting back to God? What is your passion for revival? What will be your response to how God moved in our midst this morning? Will it be a desire to draw closer to God, or will it be, I got to go back next Sunday and get another shot? That's the mindset of a lot of Christians. I'm going to have a shot every Sunday. Keeps me going. Doesn't work that way. We bring the presence of God with us when we come. God doesn't wait here all Sunday for us to show up or on Wednesday or on on Thursday or on Friday when the youth come. He's not here waiting. We bring his presence. We bring his presence. We need revival, church, in the worst. Without revival, we will die. You see, when all of these things, all of these eight things are done, and they're all in place, you won't need a long prayer.
you won't need a long prayer. See, the closer you get to God, the shorter your prayer can be for action. Listen to this. In the King James Version, Elijah's prayer before God was just 63 words. 63 words. In the New Living International Version, it was just 60 words. And in the New Living Translation, it's just 58 words. He had repaired and he had prepared the altar. Why? Because he had faith that God was faithful to what he said. God said to him in the first verse, Go to Ahab and I will send rain. Go to Ahab and I'll send rain. Elijah was confident. His faith was grounded in God. He knew that there would be rain. He wasn't sure of all the process, but he knew there would be rain. I love the way the 38th verse says, then the fire of the Lord fell. I like that phrase, the fire of the Lord. Not a fire that Elijah had created, not a false fire or a fake fire or a trickery fire or a gimmickry fire. The fire of God fell. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As fearful as that sounds and as, 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 as trembling as I, I say this, I, I say, God, send the fire again. Oh, God, send the fire again. Send the fire again. But the very first thing the fire does is it burns up the dross. That's the hard part on you and I. It's the burning up of the dross. We all love the idea that God works in our lives and then he puts us forth as vessels for his honor and glory. But the process sometimes can be very difficult. But the process is worth it if we will just seek the face of God. It's worth it. Somebody say amen. Church, it's worth it. For us to get serious with God and say, God, send personal revival in my life. My Lord, until I am prepared and repaired and you're pleased with it. And Lord, kindle us together so that you might be glorified. My Lord, stir up the churches. Holy Spirit, stir up the churches. And the churches are people like you and I. We are the church. When we say, I don't know what's wrong with the church. We are bringing question upon ourselves. We're the church. We're the church. You're the church. We need to seek God. We don't need to give God lip service or or short span attention. Most of the church has, has an attention deficit. As an attention deficit. And we need to discipline ourselves daily and moment by moment to say, oh God, By your grace. See, because when the revival comes, when revival, when fire comes, it produces some incredible things. The first thing it does, it produces supernatural results. Why? Because it's a persevering faith. It's a faith that perseveres in the midst of trial and temptation and discouragement. I like the scene in in verses 42 and 43 of chapter 18. We looked at it last week, the 41st verse. When when, when God sent the, 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 the fire and burned up everything that was on the altar, Elijah said to Ahab, get down, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. By faith he heard that sound because God had promised it to him. You understand, we looked at that last Sunday. By faith he heard the sound of the abundance of rain. He knew God was faithful. He knew God was not misleading him. He knew God wasn't playing tricks with him. He knew that God was serious when he made the promise. Elijah, you go see Ahab and I'll send the rain. I'll send it. He said there's a sound of abundance of rain because he persevered in his faith. 42, 43 says, So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of the camel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. Folk, that's not our Father who art in heaven, that will be thy name, the kingdom come, the will of the earth, and give us the day our daily bread, because our trust in the gift, give those trust in us, and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen, got my praying done. 
He put his, he put his head between his knees and he was, he, was, he was like a woman in travail. He was like a woman wanting to give birth. He was like a woman with birth pains and he was pushing, pushing, pushing. He knew God had promised it, amen. And he said, Elijah, he said to his servant, go and check for rain. So he went and checked, and there was no, no rain. There was just a small cloud. And he said to his servant, go. And Alan looked toward the sea. He went up and looked and said, there is nothing. And he said, go again seven times. Seven times. Five fingers and two thumbs. Seven times. Think about it. He had just exposed himself to Israel. He had just challenged Ahab. He had just seen the, the fire of God fall. And still it took seven more times as an expression of persevering faith, persevering revival faith, to get, see what, what God would do. And Elijah persevered. Let's read down for a few moments came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there arise a little cloud of the sea like a man's hand. And Elijah said, go, go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare your chariot and get thee down that the rain do not stop thee. One little, I, I've, I've had the privilege, I didn't tell you last, I don't think last Sunday, I've had the privilege to stand where they believe Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal and the prophet of the grove, which is 850. It's on Carmel, and it looks towards the Mediterranean, but it's also overlooking the Jezreel Valley. Anyone else ever been there on Mount Carmel? Oh, yeah, we got a whole bunch of Carmelites here. And you can look over the Mediterranean, and the Mediterranean sky is prettier in the daytime than any sky in the else in the world. It's a deep blue. And out of that, out of that big Mediterranean sea and that big blue sky, there was one little cloud. <laughs> one cloud. Elijah said, that's it. Ahab, get going. Because if you don't, you're going to get caught in the rain. And listen to the next verse. See, it's a persevering faith. Listen to the next verse. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that there, heaven was black with clouds and wind. And there was a great rain. And Ahab rod and went to Jezreel. He persevered. And the sort of supernatural result of his praying and persevering was that indeed the rain came. The rain came as God promised. God promised us revival rain when we get serious with God. Amen. The question is, what's wrong with the church? The church has lost her passion for revival. And she's replaced it with all kinds of silly things that are worthless and of no use whatsoever. I could take time and name them out. That's not what I'm doing this morning. I might do that sometime. And there's no substance anymore. There's no substance. But God has been pleased to place in our hearts a desire for revival. How many want to see God move? Last Sunday morning when I concluded my message, about 150 of you came. And you, you call out to God, oh God, revive us, revive us, revive us. See, the biggest entrance to revival is, is, is supposed success. But none of this matters. This building, this church, the finances, the, none of these things matter if God is not in our midst. None of these things matter whatsoever until there are new souls at the altar. Until we see what we saw this morning when an altar call was given and a number came and wept before the Lord. Until God's people begin to come and seek the face of God. 
until we get disciplined enough in our spiritual walk that we don't just have our little set times, but there's a passion in our hearts and we cry out continually to God while we're working at the kitchen, while we're working in the office, while we're working at the lathe, while we're working in the packing department, wherever we may be, until there's a cry in our hearts, Oh God, I just need more of you. More of you, oh God, more of you. More of you. Elijah said, there's a rain coming. Get going. And the rain came. And I love it because this chapter ends with a a very, uh, uh, a very funny picture. I've noticed it for years. It's in verse 46. Now you understand something. Ahab was the king of Israel. So when he had a chariot, it was, it was drawn by two, if not four, of the finest steeds in all of the land. Man, these horses could lay it down. They could lay it down in step. They could lay it down in sink. They could get where they planned to go. And, Eli- and Ahab was, Ahab, the rain was coming. And he knew that Elijah would come, and it was coming. And so he was, he, was, he was whipping those horses. He was getting them into the shelter of the, of the stables before it got so much rain that he couldn't pull through the mud because now the dust had turned to mud with the mixture of rain. And so he was whipping them, and they were laying it down. Ever watch a horse race on, at, 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 at Queen's Plate out there and other places? I mean, they're laying it down. They're laying it down. And he's doing pretty good. And he's just whipping his horses. And all of a sudden, this thing goes by him. And what is it? It's Elijah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love it. It, So the Bible says, Elijah, you ladies know you can't run very fast when you got a skirt down around here. And you got clothes on that keeps you keep stiffing on it. So the Bible says that Elijah girded up his garments. He had a belt. And he, he pulled it up, and he pulled the belt around, and he began to run. And the Bible says he ran in the power of the Spirit so fast that he outran the chariot. Uh, that's one of the funniest scenes in the whole of the old scriptures for me. Here, here's, Eli, here's Ahab just whipping these horses, and he's doing good. And all of a sudden, whoom! The scripture gives us this picture to tell us there is a reward when we have revival faith. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. There's reward. When we have Eli, when we have your Bible, come on back, Pastor Andrew, Pastor Mitchell, come on back. There's reward. Look, there's pain. When we're birthing something, there's pain. There is, there is obstacle. There is, there is distractions. But oh, when the child is born. The moment you hold that child in your arms, I can't speak because I've never given birth. But every mom here will tell you that when the birth pains came, they were terrible. Some of you ladies have a, have a biological makeup that you normally don't have a long, a long labor pains. I've known ladies, I've heard about ladies who have had labor pains for two or three days. Terrible, terrible. And all oh, the pain, all oh, the pain, all oh, the pain. And then it happens, Amen. The moment comes when you deliver. I've never been in a delivery room. I was too big a chicken to go in and watch my wife give birth to our three sons. And once in a while, she reminds me of it. But I tell you, I've heard enough stories that tell you that the pain is fierce and the wrestling is fierce. But when the nurse comes and takes that child, and lays it in mother's arms, something happens. You know the first thing that happens? The pain is forgotten about. Why? Because new life is placed in your arms. Church, there is pain in preparing for revival. There is, there is, there is, there is things that we need to disadvantage ourselves of and get rid of. There's things, we, patterns and habits that we have formed 
not maliciously or sinfully, but they've just crowded into our lives, and we need to, we need to put them to one side and begin to cry out before God. Oh, God, revive us again. And it might go on for a few weeks. Prayer meetings, seeking God's face in our homes, fasting, coming together with brothers or sisters and coming aside to pray and while others are being entertained and feasting. They're sacrificed, they're sacrificed. But then we come to the house of God. The music begins to play. And folk begin to get saved. The word is preached and sinners run to the altar. Those who have been sick are being healed. Those who have been thirsty for the Spirit of God are being filled with the Holy Spirit. Young men and young women that's been a nightmare for their their moms and dads are suddenly saved and transformed by the power of God. And their new emphasis is, is to serve the living God. Oh, that's when you forget about the pain of birth. That's when you forget about the pain and the, and the sacrifice and the discipline. When you see souls saved and bodies healed, Jesus glorified in all that we do. That's what helps us to forget the pain. I believe God wants to give Pio Pentecostal a revival. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that with all my heart. Some prophecies have gone forward, and I believe that for them prophecies to be fulfilled, it, is, it, it must be revival. It's unlimited what God wants to do. It's unlimited what God wants to do. Well, we say, oh God, you can count on us. Oh, God, give us that revival faith that no matter what obstacles come, we're going to push through. Give us that certain faith. Give us that bold faith to look at the devil and say, Devil, we claim this this part of the vineyard for God, and we're going to take control of it by the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit, and we are going to do what God wants us to do. Can we be bold enough to do that? Can we be bold enough to say that? You that are watching by live streaming, you're serving God, but you've been serving in a long ways off. It's time for you to get revived. It's time for your church to get revived. And there's only one way to revive, be revived. And that's go back to the giver of life. Amen. The source of life is the revival source for every church and for the church in particular. Would you stand, please? my cry to the Lord and I wrote it at the end of my message Lord send revival and revival is that individual work in our lives when I'm saying Lord send revival I'm saying Lord send revival in me the product of revival will be something else that's what we enjoy the product of revival we don't enjoy revival because, because it's sacrifice. But the product of revival, the product of revival. Lord, send us revival. Lord, give us all revival passion, revival determination, and revival faith. How many this morning would cry the very same thing. Lord, give us revival. Give me revival passion. Give me revival faith. Give me revival passion. For revival starts with me. It starts with you. Lord, revive us again. Some of you have family that's not saved. Never go to church. They're going to a lost eternity. They're going to hell. Some of you have been struggling with your spiritual life. It's gotten to a place where it composed of basically a Sunday morning service. No prayer life. No passion for God. Some of you have struggled with some sins in your life and, and it, 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 is, it is totally messed up God's presence in your life. 
Some of you walked away and some of you drifted away. But this morning, we can make it right by saying, God, here I am. I need that revival in my life. Begin in my life. Begin in my life. It's not really late, and we have no service tonight. I want to extend an invitation this morning. How many want a fresh revival in your personal life? How many want that to spread to your family? How many want that to spread to your church? Would you come out, please? Would you just come here and stand, and as a body of believers, say, Father, we want revival. We w- I want to be part of that revival. I want to be part of that revival. I want to be part of that revival. I want to push through. I, 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 I want to deal with those labor pains of revival. Come on. Just step into the altar and make room. God, I want a revival. I want to see the hand of God move. I want to see the powers of darkness broken. I want to see sin broken in the lives of people. I want to see God's people rise up and be what the church ought to be. Lord, send us revival. Lord, send us revival. That's right. Just fill this altar. Fill the aisleways. It's your expression of, oh God, oh God, I want revival. Here, regardless of what my brother or sister wants, I want revival. I want revival in my life. God, God, I want revival. Amen. Step out. You might be standing here and say, well, I, I want that, but I'm not stepping out. You need to step out because you need to have a little bit of rebellion broken in your life. Amen. I, I want revival. Lord, revive me. Revive me. Revive me. Revive me. Let, it, let there be a spark in my life that will catch another tender flake alongside of me. Lord, that's revival. Oh, the musician's going to lead us. Pastor Mitchell's going to lead us. We're just going to surrender to the Lord this morning. Amen. Come on. There are way too many people standing back there. Fill up these aisleways. Come on. You're visiting with us today. You love the Lord. You're part of the body of Christ. Come on. Come on. If that's your desire, just say, God, here I am. I'm not much, but I surrender myself to you. Lord, just fill my heart with a hunger, amen. Fill my heart with a hunger. Oh, empty and bare.
in the husks that abound, but I found no nourishment there. Now my serene's almost gone, and I feel the pull of this Yet my thirst drives me on, and I stumble along. Over ground so barren and dry. For oh, the spring's just ahead. 